So the title is here, Digitalization in the Energy Industry. It's very broad, but I guess in, in an opening talk, we can be a bit high level. So I'm not going too deep into the technical parts, but I'm sure later on in the local chapter, we'll have real deep dives into various technical issues. So I decided to put up a word in bright letters here at the top, transformation. So I think that's what we're living through now. So changes are always happening, but I think now we are seeing change at a bigger change and faster change than we have been, been used to. So we have this backdrop uh, that we are living in, uh, the energy transition. So obviously we need a reliable, reliable energy supply, and we need to make sure that this energy supply is uh, also sustainable. Uh, in addition to the energy transition, we're living through the uh, digital transformation. We see a lot of talks at various venues on uh, innovation and uh, earth science technology. Uh, I think I'll, this is what I'll focus most on in this uh, talk, uh, on uh, how we're uh, doing this digital transformation and highlight the need for uh, collaboration uh, in order to scale beyond the many, many cool demos and POCs that we have seen and really move towards uh, industry 4.0, as it is called. So I just highlight a couple of problems uh, at the start here. So obviously in the energy challenges, we have climate change, uh, CO2 emissions as the backdrop. Uh, we're also seeing, I think in the last five, six months, uh, we've seen the effects of undersupply of electricity, gas, uh, especially here in, uh, in Norway on the electricity prices and in Europe uh, on gas prices. And uh, there is some sense of urgency to, to solve these CO2 emission problems and climate change problems. So uh, the, the rate of transformation to zero emission economy is, is basically going too slow. So we need to then, of course, uh, work more on uh, renewables uh, and make sure we have a zero emission energy supply. And CO2 storage that we will get into uh, will be a part of it as long as we, since we do expect that we will continue with hydrocarbons for a long time still. Uh, there are also challenges on the data side. Uh, I think I've seen at least a hundred talks about data being inside silos and uh, not available to those who need to use it to do analysis and support decisions. Uh, another topic that frequently comes up is the quality of the data. It's too poor to just put, push it into some machine learning model and expect it to work well. We're also seeing like the uh, the uh, kind of lack of domain expertise. Uh, a lot of people are retiring. And there are a lot of other uh, jobs outside the petroleum industry that are competing for, for talent these days. And I think at this moment, uh, the last couple of years, we've seen a bunch of POCs, uh, but we have seen too little uh, of uh, innovation that makes its way into production and is really used to, to make an impact on, uh, on decision making and on solving uh, these problems, both on the energy transition and the digital transformation. So I think one key part of the data problem is that we have these huge data sets that could have been used to really do great things, but they are still severely underutilized. And the solutions we'll look into is, of course, the uh, open data ecosystem, which is a core element to fuel innovation, collaboration, uh, the innovative applications itself, uh, and the use of data science uh, to, uh, to transform the earth sciences. That's so just an illustration found online that we're seeing that there's a lot of efforts in the early stages of this data analytics uh, marathon, uh, POCs, uh, things like this. But rarely uh, do we see that the projects are completed and taken all the way to the value creation. I think that's something we should be focusing on increasingly from now on. Uh, but 
This is obviously not an easy task. And in my company, Earth Science Analytics, uh, we started off uh, focusing on the machine learning side of things. So the ML ops in the middle here. But then we quickly realized that we need a lot of tooling and infrastructure to deal with the data. So we have to do also the data ops, the data platform, and make sure that the data flows smoothly through all these applications. And only when you have the two can you move on to uh, real intelligent automation uh, of the uh, earth science uh, uh, solutions. Uh, we see on, uh, on single uh, use cases, a lot of proven value. Uh, many things we can do now with uh, AI fueled uh, technology 10 times faster. We can be, be more efficient. We can save costs. Uh, we can identify new opportunities at a large scale. So the value is, is there to be, to be had. If we just manage now in the next uh, uh, months and, and years to scale it properly. So back to the, the uh, energy uh, problem. So the world needs the sustainable and re reliable energy supply. Um, can we as geoscientists and as geoscience technology developers uh, help solve this problem with the next generation uh, earth science technology? And I firmly believe so. Uh, and CO2 storage is a key part of the solution, which means we need to find, characterize, and monitor a bunch of uh, uh, storage sites. So in, in that endeavor, we need our geoscience knowledge, and we'll also need to find new, new ways of working to do this, because it needs to be done faster than we could with traditional methods. And it also needs to be done uh, cheaper because cost uh, is an important factor here. Uh, we have here in, in Stavanger a very cool uh, startup that's getting quite big uh, that ha is transforming stranded gas in the Barents Sea into sustainable energy, basically by producing hydrogen and ammonia uh, from this and re-injecting uh, CO2 into the subsurface. So I think that's a really cool example uh, that they're doing in Horizont and Agi to uh, make a business out of uh, this energy transition. So I really hope we see a lot of use cases and companies uh, like this and, and that this becomes a success. We'll see also the need to develop offshore wind, there are big plans to do this at a huge scale. Uh, of course, when you uh, build these sites, you need to map and monitor the seabed and the subsea infrastructure. So also there, uh, there is a need for earth science competence uh, and technology. Uh, hydrothermal uh, is another one. We need to find and develop new, new sites. And uh, a common thing to all of these is that I think that the solution is that uh, we should be able to do this as profitable businesses, like doing CO2 storage as a, as a business. Of course, there are costs to this uh, that can negatively impact the profitability of such a business. So uh, we, from the earth science side, we need to be focused on how we can do our work uh, and keep the costs down. And I think technology development and new ways of working is a key part of that. So then back to this uh, one, one of the two fundamental uh, topics here, the data challenges. So it, it's this point of data being siloed. Uh, uh, we used to have applications that each application had its own data storage system. And it was, uh, well, it still is inconvenient to move data back and forth with FTP and all that. Uh, lack of finding the right data to use uh, takes a lot of time. We heard it many times, the data quality. Uh, we're suffering from this. It takes a long time to, to clean it up. So I think the efforts, I'm sure you've all heard about OSDU and this open data platform. I think it's really key that this in some form really succeeds and becomes uh, mainstream. So that 
there is an open data platform at open APIs. So all those innovative people and companies can develop applications that, that leverage this. Uh, that will really fuel the innovation and the uh, ecosystem of applications that become available. Uh, and these applications, um, they do uh, uh, specific things. So there can be a very uh, narrow applications like uh, using AI to interpret faults or horizons or geobodies. It can be uh, a machine learning to do petrophysics, to make porosity logs, saturation logs, etc. Uh, technology to uh, speed up and automate, partially automate well tie and so on. So we'll see applications uh, uh, that uses machine learning to do all these classical uh, geoscience uh, tasks. Uh, and increase the efficiency in that. But there is also another level uh, of integrating the workflows. So I've heard uh, since I was a student that we should focus on uh, integrating our uh, disciplines uh, and our data types. And now with these data platforms that are emerging, uh, th this becomes uh, possible uh, to, to do uh, and to scale. So to the left here is just illustrated uh, one form of this uh, data platform. This is the one that we have in our company. It's compatible with the OSTU. And it fuels, uh, feeds the data into all these individual workflows with different colors here. And these workflows also uh, communicate with each other. So that if you want to have, for example, a porosity volume in 3D uh, for your field, uh, you would need to do the petrophysics workflow in orange here that feeds information into the 3D property prediction workflow in blue. And you can also support uh, this exercise with information from the green seismic interpretation workflow. So it's not just one machine learning model or AI that solves uh, this puzzle. It's uh, a combination of many. And so although AI and machine learning is narrow at the moment. We don't see that it's general in the, in the meaning that one AI can solve many tasks. We can build a, a team of many uh, machine learning models that together can solve very complex tasks of basically uh, mapping the property distribution of uh, fields uh, and prospects. Uh, on the data side, uh, big heads up to Discos. It's been a huge success. And uh, of course, there's a next uh, level of uh, Discos uh, where the information flows more smoothly uh, to the applications and back to, to the database. So that is something we did in our company. We basically digitized all the released uh, well data and sample data uh, from, from Discos. So this is now readily available to use in machine learning workflows. It's also been curated QC'd. And so we built a lot of technology to do so efficiently. And once you have uh, such an asset, you can do a project such as this that we did in the collab collaboration with the MPD. Uh, basically to do petrophysics of uh, 500 uh, wells in the North Sea. Uh, but this is the machine learning version of petrophysics. But, but it produces uh, lithology logs, saturation logs, uh, porosity logs, and uh, pay flags. And f uh, with this uh, output information, uh, you can identify, uh, of course, accumulations of, uh, of oil and gas. And we see that we were able to identify many such accumulations that were in wells that are officially uh, classified as dry wells. So something like this uh, that we also did in the, in the UK, uh, supported by the OGTC, uh, now called the Net Zero Technology Center. Uh, so we've been able to do this kind of exercise on all the released wells uh, from the Norwegian North Sea and all the wells from the Northern UK North Sea. So this is an example of the scale that we can do things with now. So many thousands of wells in the ma in a matter of, uh, of months to highlight overlooked uh, opportunities. Uh, we can also see new business models. 
as an example with the TGS, the, the data company. So we set up a collaboration with them and collaboration is also a key part of this. So we use our technology to basically interpret uh, their uh, data. And this example is from the Ocean Bottom Node uh, survey in uh, UCI High. So we provide highly detailed uh, uh, rock and fluid property uh, prediction, including also the elastic properties uh, based on this uh, uh, highly advanced seismic uh, survey. Uh, with this technology that enables us to predict rock and fluid properties uh, from the seismic, we can identify uh, accumulations of oil and gas in uh, three dimensions. This was also studies supported by the, uh, the MPD and with data from CGG. And you see here the uh, gross peak uh, discovery uh, that initially was overlooked in the first well. Uh, but people who were really digging deep into the data saw that maybe there is something here anyway. And it was proven a success with the, the next well. But we see that it, it was possible to find uh, this smoking gun uh, of uh, outer carbon saturation in the first well uh, with this machine learning approach. And it was possible to map this out in, in 3D with a 3D property prediction approach. So now th this is a methodology that can be scaled and used as uh, an exploration tool to look for uh, overlooked opportunities, uh, and which is uh, happening now uh, at the larger scale. Uh, th this um, technology, so the combination of the data platform and all these individual tools and the integration of these individual tools allows us to work on uh, different scales. So you can work on the well scale with the well logs. You can work on the seismic scale that was on the previous example. Uh, but you can also dive all the way down into the sample scale. So there were some rock samples. It happens to be cuttings, but it could be any kind of rock samples. And it, with the deep learning, it's possible to interpret this data on the pixel level to say that these are shell fragments. This is a, a piece of sandstone and mudstone and so on. And that information from the samples can propagate into the well domain, be correlated with the well logs, and then from, from there propagate all the way up to the seismic scale. So now we're linking from the very small uh, to the regional uh, picture. And uh, in order to scale this, we set up another collaboration with the Rockwash Geodata. Uh, that is the company who actually obtains uh, this data. They have the machinery to do so. And they also, importantly, have the competence to provide the training data uh, that we train these machine learning models on. Uh, so now we will be doing this on all the, all the released samples uh, from the Norwegian continental shelf. Uh, it's at least more than 700,000. It might be even more. And in addition to that, we're also doing it on Rockwash's uh, proprietary images and we'll take it further uh, with other types of images. So that's an example of how we can take uh, a data asset that was previously dormant, it was there, but it was not frequently used, and turn it into a useful interpreted form that can then propagate this information into the other larger scale uh, workflows. Uh, these were uh, techniques, of course, they can also be used uh, for subsurface carbon storage. So in this example, uh, we have some machine learning models here that have uh, interpreted the extent of the CO2 plume and the slate uh, injection site in, uh, over time based on the 4D data. So this one uh, just shows the distribution, uh, but we can also use the property prediction uh, uh, technology. To, to map the distribution or the property distribution of the uh, of the reservoir and the, and the seal and, and of the uh, fluids themselves. Uh, another thing uh, with the uh, CO2 storage is that if the uh, storage sites are fault bounded, it's important to understand the risk of leakage through the faults. And this is an example uh, where my company collaborated with the University of Oslo. 
uh, to map the uh, likelihood of a fault slippage that could result in, uh, in leakage uh, from this uh, site here east of the troll field. Also using machine learning models to interpret the faults in high detail with every sample in the data set. Uh, the uh, energy transition or the green shift will also require us to have more better access to minerals. Uh, we see uh, activities on uh, the deep sea mining side. Of course, it's very important that this activity is also done in a sustainable way. Uh, so this is an exciting field to develop technology for. Uh, both for mapping the uh, mineral and metal resources, uh, doing the resource estimates, but also for mapping the, uh, the ecology uh, and uh, the impact that might be on the environment so that the decision makers can be informed on the possible environmental impacts and make good uh, regulatory decisions uh, in that field. And again, uh, machine learning comes in as a tool that can make, make us more efficient uh, and deal with uh, large amounts of data in this space. Uh, these things aren't easy to do. Uh, so it's a long way to go from a cool demo or a proof of concept to putting it into operations. So you basically need an end-to-end -end, uh, tech stack. So you need the data ops, the data platform, uh, th that needs to be open, and uh, like we see the efforts with OSTU. Uh, we need data labeling software, uh, because currently the, the commercially attractive part of machine learning is supervised learning that needs to train on ground truth. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody can be data scientists. So we are scientists, we work with data, we should be able to be data scientists. But not all of us are coding superstars. So we develop a codeless model training software. We need to be efficient in our ability to develop applications for each specific use case. Because DevOps, making sure we can deploy this in the cloud, on-prem, on the edge efficiently. And uh, number six here is ML ops. So a model can be great uh, once you have uh, tested it on your test set, but it's a fact that when you expose it to more uh, data from the real world, eventually it will not perform well. So you will need to be able to detect when that happens and you need to be able to mitigate it and provide a better version of this model. And that's why this is set up like a, a wheel that you'll have to go around and around again and again to make sure it works appropriately. So to summarize, uh, I think my main point here is that uh, digital transformation can and will support uh, the energy transition. Uh, we can accelerate uh, most workflows. Uh, we can uh, achieve higher productivity. Uh, which is important to reach the uh, net zero targets that have been set. Uh, we can save costs uh, by doing so, which is important for uh, being able to drive the energy transition as a business, as a profitable business. And we need to do so uh, also in a robust uh, way so that we make sure that we have repeat repeatable results and uh, that they that can put up to, to scrutiny. So thank you. with that, uh, thank you for the attention. Um...